Uh, welcome everyone to this final debate of the term and my final debate as co-president of the society. Thank you all for being here tonight. If you haven't voted, um, please do go and vote on the poll. I'm not going to um, read out the motion and you, you vote. Um, you are now able to go straight to the poll, so there should be some more accuracy. It's not me counting your hands, because usually that is always inaccurate. Um, and actually, we usually get a swing when there's a poll. Um, so thank you to the speakers who are with us tonight. We are, of course, debating the motion. This House believes it is acceptable to laugh about mental health. And we're very happy to do this in collaboration with Student Minds. So if there are any questions about the acceptable nature of the motion, well, Student Minds are all in favour of this. So thank you for them collaborating with us. Um, yeah, basically, I'll just, just a quick uh, idea of what the structure of the debate will be. We'll have the first proposition, First opposition, second opposition, oh, sorry, second proposition, second opposition. Trust me, I haven't drunk quite yet. Um, I will, I think we will end the poll shortly, if not now, because then we can sort of get cracking. Uh, so if you haven't voted, I'm sorry, maybe another chance at the end. Um, so I can now tell you that those in favor of the motion that this house believes it is acceptable to laugh about mental health, there are 15, those who oppose it, two and those who abstain in three. Hopefully the abstentions will be shifted by the end of this evening. Anyway, let's get cracking. And the first speaker for tonight is, I believe, Grace. Grace, you have five minutes, over to you. I think Grace, you're muted, Grace. You're muted. <laughs> but I'm sure it was a great start. Uh, <laughs> no sorry, thanks for telling me. Um, firstly, it's essential to clarify that while we believe it is acceptable to laugh about mental health, we do not think that it is acceptable to ridicule or mock those with mental health issues. We should never laugh at somebody in a mean or disrespectful manner. For example, we can all agree that it is not okay to laugh at somebody who is so depressed they can't get out of bed. Uh, the next thing uh, is that you can laugh about something without cruel intent. So on social media, you can find countless posts that poke light find that certain symptoms of mental health conditions like anxiety and social situations or lack of motivation to complete a task. These posts are popular because people can relate to those experiences, at least enough to understand whatever satire or absurdism the post contains. If anything, laughing about something is the opposite of laughing at something. Instead of singling out a subject to make fun of, we're connecting and empathizing with them. Um, saying, hey, me too. And when you're suffering from a mental illness or feeling vulnerable anyway, it's much better when you're not feeling alone and judged. Uh, furthermore, laughter is scientifically beneficial because it's proven to be a good coping mechanism due to the fact that it alleviates stress. Uh, but to tie this more specifically to the point of laughing about mental health, one 2019 study noted that 55% of participants who struggled with mental health claimed that memes about mental illness help ease their symptoms of anxiety and depression. Uh, one type of humour that is used particularly regularly when talking about mental health is self-deprecating humour. In my opinion, this certainly shouldn't be policed because when people discuss their mental health, they don't always want to be serious and that's okay. They should be allowed to talk about things in a way that makes them feel comfortable um, and kind of content in the conversation. Uh, feeling at ease in a conversation about mental health is particularly important because of the stigma surrounding mental illness. Uh, considering that building up some light humour around the topic can help people more, feel more comfortable opening up about their mental health, it is vital we are able to laugh about it. Through these conversations, people might feel more relaxed as a result of laughter and could learn about mental health, illness or get help if they need it. It would at least challenge the notion that mental illness, mental health issues, are a terrible secret only to be discussed in the most grave and specific of ways and specific situations. Uh, for example, you could send your friend a meme about how messed up your sleep schedule is, uh, which can help you cope and even open up a conversation about it because uh, it lets, and it's helpful because it lets go of the feeling that you're supposed to feel like you're struggling. Okay, I've finished, thank you. Thank you, Grace. Um, brilliant opening speech and uh, thank you for um, this being your first debate with uh, Fitzwilliam Debate and Society, so thank you for that. Um, I am told, I've been given my sort of advice, um, just to remind everyone that you're all welcome to ask questions in the chat 
uh, or message me privately. If possible, try and save them towards the end because I know that there can be a tendency for some to ask comments or make comments and questions during the debate and then speakers reply to them immediately, which is not necessarily the most helpful thing. Um, but thank you, Grace. And we move now straight to, I believe, Isabella. Uh, hi. Yeah. So the 1980s cult classic sci-fi series, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, features a fan favorite character, Marvin the Paranoid Android. Marvin is clearly depressed. He jokes about wanting to short circuit himself, moans his way through the adventures of the book, and is called depressed by the other characters. But his depression is a punchline. The character isn't opening up conversations or encouraging others with depression to seek help. He's a joke. We are supposed to laugh about his poor mental health. But that was the 1980s, right? And we've come a long way since then, haven't we? The proposition has suggested that through laughing about mental health, we can build empathy, stop people from feeling so alone, and ease ourselves into a conversation that doesn't have to be serious. But I'd like to argue that we've come full circle. Mental health is back on the comedy agenda, and this time it's normalized, it's banal even. Who hasn't laughed at the gif of James Acaster on Bake Off? Made it, had a breakdown, bon appetit. I know I have. And who, haven't, who hasn't in the same vein joked about having a breakdown when something has become too challenging for us or driven us past what we can deal with? I'm as guilty as anyone of coming into the flat kitchen after a long and difficult day and joking, yep, had a breakdown. <laughs> I tell myself that I'm normalizing mental health and making it easier for others to share their breakdowns and share their difficult conversations around mental health. But I'd like to argue that it's quite the opposite. We've opened up a conversation about mental health, but we've done it in such a way that poor mental health has become normalized and even standardized. It's no longer Marvin, the sole character who has to struggle with depression. Now, especially since the pandemic has turned our lives upside down. The vast majority of us at Cambridge are struggling in some way. You only have to look at recent canvases to see what I mean. But as the proposition suggested, isn't this perfect? We have comedy and a method of discussing our poor mental health. It's normal to talk about it, right? But through comedy and jokes, poor mental health has become banal and over-normalized. Why is this a problem? I would argue there are two reasons. One is it's become very difficult to tell if your friends are really in need of help and intervention. We have become numb to poor mental health. We exist in this cultural milieu where everyone is joking about their mental health and it's become so much harder to spot those who really mean it who when they said they had a breakdown, they really did. And they are in need of a serious conversation and someone to intervene and offer them the help that they need. People who are struggling, they express this through jokes. That's normalized as the proposition suggested. It can be a way of discussing mental health without feeling the need to open a serious conversation. But because everyone is joking about mental health, it's become harder to spot when those jokes are something that is not dangerous, but a sign of something more problematic. These conversations need to happen in a serious manner where you can sit a friend down and say, I think you should see someone. I think you need to take this further and deal with these problems. Not laugh them off as another breakdown. But I would argue the worse and more insidious problem is how hard it's becoming to spot if you're struggling with your own mental health. Everyone is joking about how sad they are. And yes, we are all struggling in this pandemic, but we have normalized poor mental health through our humor and people are becoming unaware if they need to seek help and if they have a problem. And I'm here to tell you that if you are struggling to get through the day, if you're crying during Zoom classes, and especially if you're experiencing any form of suicidal thoughts, you need to seek help in a professional and serious context, not just joke about it. 
it's while men, while we are opening conversations that are normalizing mental health we're normalizing breakdowns we're normalizing struggling and while these things are unfortunately becoming normal at cambridge and in university settings they must not be normalized they must not be trivialized they must not become banal we need to have serious conversations about mental health thank you thank you isabel um i know that usually we have questions in between speakers but partly because I went, my mind went to sleep and also partly because I've suddenly got used to Brewster having been only last week, we're not gonna have questions in between. Um, so if you can save all your questions to the end, as I said earlier anyway, um, that would be great. Message me privately or do message the chat um, to ask your questions. You can be anonymous, so it's fine. Don't worry, no one's gonna bully you about it. Um, so let's move on and let's move to, am I right in saying that it's Erin next? Yep, brilliant, Erin. Cool, so I have no idea how long my speech is gonna take me because I haven't timed it, but I'll just um, talk on Isabel's speech first. So I don't disagree with Isabel um, and I'd love to talk to her about this uh, in more depth. Um, and I'm gonna quote some, some Natsuki stuff here. It's just, it, I think it links to the wider issue of and it's a philosophical issue of diagnosing mental health conditions. Um, my eyes have been opened to the, the big Pandora's box that it is. And I think it's also an important discussion to be had between blurring lines between mental well-being and serious um, mental health persistent conditions. Um, yeah, but I'll uh, move on to what I'm going to say now. So firstly, just to emphasise what Grace said at the start of her speech, um, Mental health, it's not a joke. I don't think I need to explain to anyone in the room that mental health is one of the biggest adversities facing particularly our generation today. Um, and that was before we plunged into a global pandemic. Um, just a warning, there will be some brief mentions of health mental health conditions. So mental health is such a broad term. It encompasses the presence and absence of mental disorders, which in self itself includes over 450 diagnosable conditions, ranging from neurological and developmental disorders like autism to eating disorders and psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia. No decent human being is going to laugh at the suffering that these conditions can evoke. But it is also important to recognise that people that have many um, mental health conditions, disorders, however you wish to describe it. And this varies on a case by case base basis. Many people don't like to dwindle on this point. They don't see themselves as suffering or victims of their condition. And for many people, laughing about it is how they like to talk about their own condition. And I guess I would disagree with Isabel's point that it's this is a result of normalization. Um, I, I think it relates to personality of the individual. And I think I don't think it's right to suggest to someone that wants to joke about their, their own feelings that they're not allowed to talk about them in the manner that they wish. And even if we made this exception, so you can joke about yourself, but not others, it's not enough. What about, what about families of people with mental health conditions? Do we say that they shouldn't joke about it amongst themselves? Um, where do we stop? Creating these kind of complicated social norms about what is and isn't acceptable or just isn't realistic. Things come and go from the, the realm of acceptability and policing of this, I just don't think is a reasonable suggestion. I think we let the individual decide if the timings and the context of their joke is appropriate, which in many cases it's not. There's no disagreeing that there's bad jokes about mental health that shouldn't be said, um, but let them face the consequences of that. Um, let's not shut down the positives of joking about mental health, as has already been explored by Grace. When we turn to the problem of stigmatization and trivialization of mental health, discussions do become really complicated and in many cases they become personal. Stigma is a complicated thing. It can come from society, but it can also come from within the person and that's not to put any onus on that person. It's just, it's complicated. There's no single cause and it's similar with trivialization. Some people will find humorous references to mental health trivializing, attached to negative connotations, but Others won't. And how do we reconcile the two? I think it just comes back to this problem that I touched on about creating rules for societies. Who do we let make jokes? Who makes the decisions? What situations? Removing humour from the equation just isn't the solution. Um, 
One of the biggest problems with asserting that you can't laugh about mental health is that you do reduce discussion about it, which is obviously exactly the opposite of what we need. There's a number of different scenarios to which this applies. First, um, the idea that we can only have serious conversations about mental health, as was kind of touched on by Grace, even with your friends, it can be it can be difficult to start this conversation. Um, and it can be made easier by chatting about it informally, even, even completely indirect conversations via a couple of memes. Um, a friend sending you a meme is a poor mental as a about their poor mental health might remind you to, you know, check in on them. And it's not a solution. I'm not saying we treat mental health conditions with memes, but it's a step forwards. Secondly, on a bigger scale, shutting down jokes about mental health creates a, a fear around the topic, a fear of offending people with what you're going to say. And whether or not you think fear of offending someone is a reasonable excuse to not be talking about something, it's undeniable that this is a thing. It, it reduces conversation, whether you agree with the people doing that or not. Ultimately, it comes down to the individual. There's no benefit to placing some kind of effective blanket moral ban on joking about mental health. It, it'd be a detriment to the individuals suffering from mental health problems to which who feel this is a helpful solu solution to them. Um, it's it's going to do little, if any, benefit to reducing stigmatization. It's just not the, not the solution. It's just going to put us further behind in our fight to combat poor mental health, which I don't think I need to repeat is probably a big concern for many of our audience this evening. If it takes humour and joking to get people talking about their mental health, then so be it. And I urge you all to support the motion to keep encouraging conversations about our mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Uh, we were getting close to muting, but well done. Thank you uh, for largely keeping to time. Um, if you just a reminder again, obviously feel free to ask questions in the chat. Also, um, if you want to send them privately, send them to myself, George Richmond, rather than the Fitz Debating um, Society account, just because um, Sean is running that, but he's sort of running the background stuff rather than the questions. So if possible, please, if you do want to send them privately, do send them to me. Um, otherwise, we will move finally to Sibylla. Over to you. I think I'm being a killjoy on the propositions, various hints arguments, the supposed positives that come with joking about mental health. Uh, when I say that we need to take mental health seriously, the proposition have tried to tell us that laughing about mental health doesn't make mental health a joke, but this is an impossible suggestion. So laugh about mental health is immediately to reduce it, to trivialise it and dismiss it as something that we desperately need to talk about. We've heard it being described as connecting, empathising, normalising about mental well-being. But I'm going to be talking about how actually um, we're limiting talking about mental health and we're making the problem worse by joking about it. Now, we've heard from Isabel about the trivialisation that comes with joking about mental health. And I'm going to talk about um, two key things. Firstly, the fact that we're facing a mental health crisis and we have to acknowledge and talk about this. And secondly, the difference between laughing about mental health and talking about mental health. And the fact that it stops conversations and hides its severity and urgency when we reduce it to mere jokes. So my first point, the importance of talking about mental health. I'm sure many of you are aware of the severity of mental health problems, and it's something that both the proposition speakers have talked about. Just some quick facts to really highlight how depressing it is. 16 people commit suicide every day in the UK, and it's estimated as many as 400 others try. Uh, it costs the UK economy £34.9 billion pounds a year, and it's a well-known fact that suicide is the leading, leading cause of death in young men. And um, mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, PTSD have a large impact on people's lives. It's a lifelong battle, it affects the futures, it affects relationships, families, communities, um, even income, um, education, quality of life, and unfortunately a much shorter lifespan as well. Now, talking about mental health is important because it breaks down stereotypes, it improves relationships, it aids recovery, it takes out the stigma. These um, benefits go on and on, but hopefully what I've told you here are things that you already agree with and 
you're wondering, what has this got to do with laughing? What is the distinction between talking about mental health and laughing about it? And why is it wrong to be laughing about it and right to be talking about it? So the proposition of data arguments on the fact that laughing helps people uh, want to talk, they want to talk about it through laughing and it helps perhaps lift taboo, things that are difficult to talk about otherwise. And yes, yeah, talking is beneficial. But uh, their argument is not really showing how it's any more beneficial to be laughing than talking. The beneficial ways of communication that we've seen are through helplines, through therapy, counselling, courses such as the one I've been doing with the university, with MIND, that takes the situation extremely seriously and helps us come to terms with situations in a way that isn't questioned or joked about or um, putting our thoughts and beliefs into question in the way that jokes do. It's important to have someone listening and giving advice and helping us acknowledge the importance. And these are the issues of such severity that jokes really can't, um, can't make up for that. More importantly, these forms of talking that do not uh, use jokes help us legitimize a topic that has up until very recently just been dismissed as emotional as perhaps linked with gender as like a phase and these are stereotypes that are actually going to be enforced by laughing about it and really uh, doing more uh, wrong than right. Now moving on to the wrong ways of talking about mental health these are jokes these are insults, offhand comments, and the results of laughing about mental health. The propositions focus on memes as a positive way of connecting, but the reality of these memes is that it's a normalization, trivialization, and what, most importantly, it's a simplification of complex problems reduced to a few words and pictures. And these lead to the normalization of people saying things like, I want to kill myself, or she's such a psycho and stopping conversations about mental health and refusing to acknowledge the complexity of these situations. Therefore, although laughing creates a dialogue about mental health, is it helpful? No, it's destructive, it's detrimental, and should therefore be discouraged as much as possible in our society. The biggest effect of this is that it stops conversations. This is what the proposition has been focused on, the creation of conversations. In fact, it doesn't because it stops it being taken seriously. For example, Cambridge trivialising week five blues, the flood of posts on campus suggesting that everyone has these mental health problems, and therefore it stops people from understanding their own personal situations and actually taking active steps from that for a serious situation. There's no point seeing a meme and agreeing with it if you're then not going to realise that the problem affects you personally and is a an issue that is more serious than some social media than an anonymous post on campus. So I will come to my conclusion, as I feel I've probably reached five minutes. Um, in conclusion, I've told you why mental health is important. It's one of the most effective ways we can, talking about it is one of the most effective ways we can treat problems and educate people. And if you agree with me on that, please join me in opposing the motion. It's unacceptable to laugh about mental health problems. It's not a form of talking about it. In fact, it stops us talking about it. And it's an outdated, disproven, and downright dangerous um, form of thinking that is unacceptable in our society. Thank you, Thank you Sibylla. Um, slightly over time, but nevertheless you did it someone has to replicate jack bailey sometimes right well uh thank you all to the thank you all speakers uh for your brilliant speeches um on a, a topic that of course can be uh somewhat controversial um so thank you for those we do already have some questions which is brilliant but also audience members feel free to keep sending them in um the first question goes to the first opposition isabel um the question really is about do yeah, is the first opposition um do they sort of argue that the do they lessen the experiences of people with mental health problems who say that joking is part of a healthy set of coping methods of them i think this really addresses something that erin was saying as well i don't want to suggest that one should never joke about mental health especially if you have a mental health problem so Maybe that would be my preference. What I think is important is that we don't build up this cultural milieu where it is incredibly normalized to joke about mental health. We need to see mental health issues and mental illnesses 
as a problem, as something that needs, we just see them on par, I suppose, with physical illnesses, something that needs to be rectified and that are in need of support and professional help. I worry that at the moment we create a culture where we're so keen to break the stigma on these issues that they're constantly joked about, that they're something that is simply not taken seriously. Of course, I respect the right of someone who has a mental illness to joke about that, but we do need to be careful that those jokes aren't hiding serious problems and they're also not hiding serious calls for help. I personally couldn't forgive myself if something were to happen to a friend and I had known about their mental health problem, but only through jokes. And I hadn't taken any of those jokes seriously because they were hidden in a wider culture where it's incredibly common to joke about mental health. So for me, the main problem is our cultural milieu of joking about it rather than any individual's experience of their mental health problem. Thank you for that. And uh, fellow speakers, your welcome to come in on certain questions as well um so oh erin yeah yeah i'll just i guess i'll just re-emphasize um my earlier point is I, I don't disagree with isabel at all it is a very it's very difficult like the question itself suggested that it's difficult this line between where how do we measure who's who's more serious than another person it, it is complicated and it ties into these wider issues of how mental health is diagnosed the symptoms like it's you can have entirely different symptoms and be diagnosed with exactly the same condition i just think that this is almost a separate problem to the problem at hand as isabel did just concede that it is acceptable to laugh about mental health in some cases um which is it is the motion it's exactly what grace and i said but we do respect that it's it's not a joke and it's not something to not be taken seriously it's just it's it's acceptable to laugh about it in some cases um we you'll have a chance to sort of reply i think um around other questions i i don't want to get too far as much as i welcome speakers having to go at each other i don't want too much of a sort of tittle tattle um otherwise we could be here all night um but i have another question but this is for the proposition really but i think other speakers um may also have a view on this uh i will aim this at the proposition speaker who hasn't spoken uh, on questions grace um first if you don't mind how does one know if a joke has gone too far? Who is the one who decides that? Um, and obviously other speakers are allowed to come in on that as well. Grace, are you not willing to do that one? Erin, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess it, it applies to any humour. This is the problem and this is, it's not really a question with a solution, I guess. I, I kind of alluded to it in my speech. It's, it's humour is rarely something that can be policed. And if it is policed, it's policed by society. It's policed by norms. It's policed by what is acceptable by the consensus of society. And someone makes a, excuse my French, shit joke, then they're going to get a bad reaction. No one's going to like it they're just an idiot um it's there isn't there isn't strict rules on where we draw the line with things it, it it's just down to the individual in in my opinion isabel yeah i'd like to take issue with that because i think there are plenty of lines that we draw in humor in this day and age particularly in the 21st century now i don't want to get accused of being too politically correct but if i have a friend that makes a sexist joke i will call him or maybe them i will call them out on it if i have a friend who makes a racist joke i will call them out on that there are lines that we divide in society around humor so i don't see why there shouldn't be lines about mental health and we can still have serious conversations about sexism while not joking about it i've had plenty of conversations with people about the serious problems of sexism in our society and I've also called plenty of people out for making jokes I believe to be sexist. The two things are not mutually exclusive. And I think we can have the same with mental health. There can be lines on humour and what is acceptable and on calling people out for making jokes about mental health while also having serious conversations. 
So I would just take issue with the idea that there is no way in society that we can police humour, because plenty of humour policing does take place in this day. Thank you, Isabel. And one more question for you. Um, it seemed to be very popular with the audience tonight. Um, considering how important representation in the media is, what issue does the first opposition, Isabel, have with a character with a mental health issue being humanised and represented in a popular media, the Guardians of the Galaxy thing, since being able to laugh at yourself is a humanising medium? Well, I think The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is very much of its time. It's 1980s. The comedy, I mean, it's, it's three white men and one white woman wander around the galaxy, isn't it? It's not exactly the most progressive of comedies. The problem specifically with it is that the punchline is always Marvin is very depressed. So I would definitely hold it up as an example of the wrong way to joke about mental health. And while I'd like to argue that there is no right way to joke about mental health, there are definitely degrees of wrongness. And I think having a character whose punchline is always, he wants to die, is actually not a very productive way to hold a conversation or to have any sort of representation of a depressed character. And uh, not to show my age, but there was a really great depressed character on The Archers recently. Um, so there are ways in which we can hold conversations and have depression represented in the media. And I do think that The Archers was a really good, sorry about that, was a really good example of bringing that to an older audience, not me, who might not have those conversations about depression and mental health going on in the like over 50s. And that was an example of where we can bring those conversations in. But I think that The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, much as I love it, is an example of the worst way possible to deal with a depressed character. Thank you for that, Isabel. Um, and as a fellow or former fellow Archer lover, I, I, I recognise that entry into the debate. Anyway, um, another question for the proposition, just to keep you guys on your toes. How can laughing be a positive way of communication specifically? Erin, um, do you want to take that? Yeah, how, how can laughter be a positive way of communication? I just, it comes back down to the individual basis. I just, one thing that I feel quite strongly on, and if you've watched me talk before, not that I've done it much, um, this is something I come back to a lot. It is just this idea of who gets to decide for another person. It's if I want to joke about my mental health and I want to communicate it to my friends, which I'll hold my hands up like I, I do. I joke about things like stress during term time with my friends. I do. And I don't see why I can't. It, it, it is a positive way for me to communicate it because if I'm not sitting there sort of joking about it with my friends, what am I doing? I'm I'm sitting here and I'm going to be miserable. This And this is just me talking about myself. I don't want to make assertions for any other person. But if it, if it helps you cope, I see that as a, a positive piece of communication. It is just coping it. And that's doesn't take away from the opposition's points about seriousness and the importance of those that need help seeking it and those being encouraged. And I, I think people are. People are encouraged to do that. And allowing them to, to joke about it with their friends um, doesn't hold that for me. And that's, yeah. Thank you, Erin. And uh, thank you to all the questions so far. Please do keep them coming in, Sibylla. Do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I think this question of um, regulation and things has been brought up by the proposition a few times. I just thought I'd um, highlight, just referring actually back to the to the motion um, that this House believes it's acceptable to laugh about mental health. Uh, the term acceptable is usually used in the context. I think here it has definitely been used in a social and moral context of um socially acceptable and morally acceptable and i think that is the answer to your question of who is regulating who is policing it it is society when we talk about something being society, socially acceptable that means accepted uh by the people and what the general consensus is on a topic and i think in just the same way that we know um not to make those with uh, racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, um, Islamophobia, these issues are uh, things that are regulated, policed by society already very effectively, um, perhaps too effectively, but I think these are definitely the sort of regulations that we, uh, as the opposition, are 
um, are thinking about when we oppose this motion. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to rebut this question of there not being a policing system in place. Thank you for that, Sibylla. Uh, another question for the first opposition. I'm sorry, you're, you're really being kept on your toes tonight. It's really about, um, I think, the use of fictitious characters again. Even the humorous character Paranoid Android has inspired a serious song of the same name about mental health, showing that a depressed character who may have been made fun of can then be used to express emotion and mental health struggles. Can we really draw such a harsh boundary between humour and seriousness? Maybe they can be united or combined through art and creativity. Sorry to keep you on your toes, Isabel. Over to you. I should have known better than to use an example. Um, I think that the key word there is serious. I'm really glad that something serious can come out of this depiction of Marvin. Um, and I certainly think he is a character that can spark conversation. But I don't think his intention was ever to spark conversation. Um, I also think that there is a cyclical nature to it, that this song has come after this 1980s um, radio show, book, TV show. And that we, in our progression in talking about mental health, we started off with this, you know, what is mental health? We reached a point of we can joke about some of these characters that are depressed. And now, and then we reached a point maybe where we had a serious conversation going on. But I think that now, and maybe maybe it is the internet, maybe it is the use of memes to discuss mental health. We've reached a point where mental health is banal again, where a character like Marvin is there, you know, being depressed, ha ha, that's the joke. And I really think we've reached that point again. And that maybe in the middle, we got this brilliant serious song that was about dealing with depression, but that we've come back round full circle to a point where the joke is depression. It's not a conversation. It's not a, this is how you should deal help. You should seek help for it. The joke is, ha, huh, someone is depressed. Thank you for that, Isabel. Erin, um, I have a question for you. So I, I would hold off um, answering um, or responding to that quite yet. Um, so for the proposition, and I, I think I'll hand it over to you, Erin. Uh, for the proposition, how does this differ with disabilities that fall under the mental health category, e.g. autism, uh, Down syndrome, ADHD, where mental health is an innate characteristic and is less solvable? And to the opposition, oh, there's two questions, so opposition pay attention at least and remember this. Um, and to the opposition, how do these illnesses interact with their hyper-focus about mental illnesses being problems since the rhetoric seems quite ostracizing and othering? First, obviously, Erin and then opposition try and retain it in your brains for now. It's hard enough for me to retain one question, so good luck to the opposition. I'm glad that this I didn't respond to Isabel because it just, and this question comes back to this drawing of lines, which I feel the opposition is slightly, I'm not entirely sure where they've they've drawn this line. I guess in going against the motion, it seems sort of like a, a blanket ban, and Sibylla just touched on um. The, the lines we draw with sexism and racism. And it this question that I've just been posed about the conditions like I touched on autism, it does, it becomes a blurred line. And I think it all, I'm drawing ties all over the place, but it links into the, the other question for the opposition. It's, it is difficult. And the distinction to be made is what is being laughed at. I think both Grace and I, highlighted that it's not a case of it's acceptable to laugh at people with mental health conditions and their suffering it's not funny to make discriminatory jokes like other protected characteristics because the the poser of this question is quite right in saying that it is a protective characteristic um it's a it is a condition and you mentioned things like autism and schizophrenia which are known psychiatric conditions in the case of schizophrenia autism is de developmental but still comes under the the category of um mental health sorry i'm a bit bit of a ramble now um but you'd be surprised however how uh, how many other mental health conditions would fall under this and would come under protective characteristics and the distinction to be made is it is not acceptable to make the the kind of discriminatory jokes that the opposition is intent on barring like we're all for that completely but that's just in no way comparable to 
laughing about your own mental health, laughing and joking about general mental health. There's a difference between discriminatory jokes and making laugh in general. Making laugh, that's not a word, but thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. And I'm going to redo the, the, uh, the opposition question just so you remember it. I'm sure you already do, but um, just to repeat it, and I think I'm going to aim it at Sibylla since Isabel's had to do a lot of, uh, had a lot of questions aimed specifically at her. Um, so the question to the opposition was, how do these illnesses interact with their hyper-focus about mental illnesses being problems, since the rhetoric seems quite ostracizing and othering? Over to you, Sibylla. Um, I'm, I firstly want to, uh, I guess, apologise for not um, including a broader, a broader spectrum, which obviously does exist, um, and can partly excuse that to um, the, the, the five minute time limit, which is very rapidly uh, reached in, in such a complex uh, topic. Um, but I think that uh, when we're looking at disability in particular, I think we can see a in um, a sort of historic, very um, dismissive and um, reductive uh, like view of, um, of disability, such as an example, just because I was listening to the talk, there's the greatest shame with, with P.T. Barnum and um, his circus, um, where he basically uh, did they, it was just a sort of a circus, um, of people with disabilities, which is horrendous. And I think that is a clear example of how um, people taking these uh, disabilities seriously, perhaps actually just taking them as a sort of human um, uh, quality and normalizing it and therefore not making jokes about it and treating it uh, in a serious and, um, and normal way has actually seen much better representation in media as uh, has been the focus with a lot of questions um and yeah so this question of otherness i think is actually reduced if we um if we if, if joking is unacceptable then we are gonna um another effect of that will be less othering they won't it won't be um something that can be joked about or should be joked but that's not um and I think that will lead to better unity thank, oh thank you for that Sibylla uh yes Isabel and just to add to that I suppose I'd like to emphasize that the goal is not to ostracize and not to suggest that there is a small subsection of people that have mental illnesses and they should be kept in a corner and we won't joke about it or talk about it the goal is that everyone has mental health some days better than others and some days less good um so what we need is a culture where we can have conversations about this wouldn't it be better if you come into the kitchen after a long day and say oh, that was really tough i felt really sad halfway through that day you get a pat on the shoulder from your housemates and if that carries on they say hey do you want to speak to someone about this what we've got at the moment is people making jokes about how breakdown wasn't great. That doesn't promote a culture where we converse about it. I don't want a society where we've got a small subsection of people and maybe they're allowed to make jokes because they've been diagnosed with a mental illness and the rest of us aren't. What I want is a society where we all acknowledge that we've all got problems and benefits of our mental health. It goes up and down at times, but that overall, we can have serious conversations about it rather than always treating this in such a jokey manner just to clarify that the goal is not to ostracize thank you for that isabel uh we have one more question uh up but just before we do so i do obviously want to give time uh for polling and i don't want us to be sat here staring at each other um for two minutes blindly so can you all please go and vote i've opened the poll again go vote 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 and um yeah last question i've got so far if anyone has any other questions you have got chance to so squeeze them in now type very quickly um opposition and i think well either two of you can answer it and erin feel free to you know charge in and, and uh, destroy their argument as well is there a possibility that by removing people's ability to make jokes about their own condition that they may have no longer have a way to express 
uh, their suffering since they may be uncomfortable expressing it in any other way or have problems expressing it in any other way. Of course, we should also encourage talking about these things seriously, but maybe by encouraging people not to make jokes, then we may be ending up harming the ability of people to express their problems. Uh, who wants to take that one? Sybilla or Isabel? It's not a race, guys. Stay on. Yeah, okay, Isabel. Okay, I can, we can take it, take it in turn. You can go to Isabel if you want to come after. Um, I think I understand um, that, uh, that, that concern, but I think actually the opposite culture um, would actually develop. I think um, if joking was um, about mental health was uh, deemed unacceptable, then I think we'd actually develop a much healthier culture in general when it comes to um, the issue of mental health. And it wouldn't be seen as something that um, could be potentially just a joke and could be that trivial and dismissed. And actually, I think removing that trivialization and that attitude that is sort of too lighthearted and simplifying, then actually it will just make um, our general attitudes to um, mental health um better and i think and to not sound too just like i'm hypothesizing thinking to the changing um approach to sexism where in the past if someone it was uh something definitely uh the uh, the sort of um objectification of women was something that was uh, joked about particularly by men but um as we saw that become less acceptable we actually saw now we see um people in a very healthy discourse about it and much more safely communicating without actually that very negative joking and that very destructive joking culture on the side so i think if we can see any change in the same way that we've seen uh the progress um it's not the progress of sexism, the progress against sexism, um, then that is what uh, we as the opposition are promoting. William, and do either two of the other um, speakers, I know, yes, as well. Yes, what I'd really like to emphasize there um, from what we've said is that we've gone too far. I, I, as the opposition, we'd like to take away the privileges that people have to joke about mental health. We, we all tried it out and we've pushed our culture to a point where serious conversations aren't being had because mental health is treated in a jokey way. Um, so I suppose we take a two pronged approach. One is that we reduce the number of jokes that are going on about mental health. And the other is that we make sure we're developing methods and cultures in which we can talk seriously about mental health. And those two things can happen at the same time. It's not that you can't joke about mental health. We've shut down that avenue forever. No more mental health talking. No more mental health talks. The goal is we will reduce the number of conversations that are happening in such a jokey manner. And as a result, we will create a culture where it is easier to talk about mental health in a way that helps people to progress and do things that will improve their mental health. Thank you. Erin, uh, did you want to say any final words? You yeah, did. I guess just, just to summarize, I think there's been a, a lot of overlap and agreement between the two sides in this debate. And regardless, you've probably already voted now anyway, so you can just not listen to me if you want. But I think the, the fundamental point we disagree on here is the solution. I think we all agree with the problem, um, but it's, it's all well and good saying you want to live in a society a certain way and you want to take away this bad thing. But unfortunately, I just I don't believe that's the way progress in society works. I wish it did. I wish we could take away all the, the crap we don't want, but I just don't see that as a solution. I just think taking something away it's not going to work. Why don't we just focus like like the proposition ha the opposition has focused on is these positives, this this education um, about mental health. Let's not ban jokes and educate. Let's educate and watch the the shit jokes, the discrimination disappear. That's that's my solution. Um, and I think that will help to distinguish the other point that has been touched on in this debate is distinguishing between the the overall importance to talk about mental well-being and then to to tackle mental health disorders at the same time 
that uh, yeah that distinction thanks thank you so much Erin and thank you to all our speakers including Grace Erin Sibylla and Isabel, you've all done brilliant tonight. Um, just to not, not cause more controversy, but I'm actually told by a reliable source that there was no mention uh, necessarily of race in the Hitchhiker's Guide. So we don't necessarily know if they were two white people, but so that's all I'm told by reliable sources. Um, I didn't research that personally, so don't take it from me. Um, also, the poll results are in, and I can inform you that we've had a slight swing uh, probably not in favour of Erin and the proposition, uh, but we, I can announce that those in favour of it is acceptable to laugh about mental health have voted 14. Oh, suddenly there's one vote in now. Oh, no, 15. OK, people have now just taken the piss. Seven and one for the, one, uh, seven for the opposition and one for abstention. Um, suddenly two people decided to vote as I was speaking. Uh, so not necessarily a swing. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for coming. I do have a quick message from the Student Minds Cambridge who have been collabing on this. Uh, they have the president who was here but unfortunately had a, a laptop that was dying um, has said thank you on their behalf and the debate has been very productive. Oh, Anna is here. No, Anna may not. Does Anna want to speak? No, never mind. Okay, the debate has been very productive, engaging, and it's fantastic to see so much female representation. That was a message from Anna. So um, on behalf of Student Minds at Cambridge. Uh, for me, thank you so much. It was a brilliant last debate. It was brilliant to obviously have um, an all-female uh, panel tonight. And thank you to all everyone who voted as well. Uh, and also just to announce that, of course, Natasha Huang will be taking over next term. So um, well done, Natasha. She'll be in charge. Uh, no longer will it be my responsibility to clamp down on Jack Bailey. Anyway, thank you all um, and have a good evening. Good night. <laughs>